He stiffened and bowed. "My lord, you are in the right. I am a fool. But don't be accounting me an ingrate as well. If I have hesitated, it is because there are considerations with which I will not trouble your lordship." "Apple blossoms, I suppose," sniffed his lordship. This time Blood laughed, but there was still a lingering wistfulness in his eyes. "It shall be as you wish. And very gratefully, let me assure your lordship. Why?" "I shall know how to earn his Majesty's approbation. You may depend upon my loyal service." "If I didn't, I shouldn't offer you this governorship." Thus it was settled. Blood's commission was made out and sealed in the presence of Mallard, the Commandant, and the other officers of the garrison, who looked on in round eyed astonishment, but kept their thoughts to themselves. "Now we can about our business go," said van der Kuylen. "We sail to morrow morning," his lordship announced. Blood was startled. "And Colonel Bishop?" he asked. "He becomes your affair. You are now the Governor. You will deal with him as you think proper on his return." "Hang him from his own yardarm. He deserves it." "Isn't the task a trifle invidious?" wondered Blood. "Very well. I'll leave a letter for him. I hope he'll like it." Captain Blood took up his duties at once. There was much to be done to place Port Royal in a proper state of defense after what had happened there. He made an inspection of the ruined fort and issued instructions for the work upon it, which was to be started immediately. Next he ordered the careening of the three French vessels that they might be rendered seaworthy once more. Finally, with the sanction of Lord Willoughby, he marshaled his buccaneers and surrendered to them one-fifth of the captured treasure, leaving it to their choice thereafter, either to depart or to enroll themselves in the service of King William. A score of them elected to remain, and amongst these were Jeremy Pitt, Ogle, and Dyke, whose outlawry, like Blood's, had come to an end with the downfall of King James. They were, saving old Wolverstone, who had been left behind at Cartagena, the only survivors of that band of rebels convict who had left Barbados over three years ago in the Cinco Lagas. On the following morning, whilst van der Kuhlen's fleet was making finally ready for sea, Blood sat in the spacious whitewashed room that was the governor's office, when Major Mallard brought him word that Bishop's homing squadron was in sight. That is very well, said Blood. I am glad he comes before Lord Willoughby's departure. The orders, Major, are that you place him under arrest the moment he steps ashore, then bring him here to me. A moment, he wrote a hurried note. That to Lord Willoughby aboard Admiral van der Kuhlen's flagship. Major Mallard saluted and departed. Peter Blood sat back in his chair and stared at the ceiling, frowning. Time moved on. Came a tap at the door, and an elderly Negro slave presented himself. Would His Excellency receive Miss Bishop? His Excellency changed color. He sat quite still, staring at the Negro a moment, conscious that his pulses were drumming in a manner wholly unusual to them. Then he quietly assented. He rose when she entered, and if he was not as pale as she was, it was because his tan dissembled it. For a moment there was silence between them as they stood looking at each other. Then she moved forward, and began at last to speak, haltingly, in an unsteady voice, amazing in one usually so calm and deliberate. I... I... Major Mallard has just told me... Major Mallard exceeded his duty, said Blood, and because of the effort he made to steady his voice, it sounded harsh and unduly loud. He saw her start and stop, and instantly made amends. You alarm yourself without reason, Miss Bishop. Whatever may lie between me and your uncle, you may be sure that I shall not follow the example he has set me. I shall not abuse my position to prosecute a private vengeance. On the contrary, I shall abuse it to protect him. Lord Willoughby's recommendation to me is that I shall treat him without mercy. My own intention is to send him back to his plantation in Barbados. She came slowly forward now. I, I am glad that you will do that. Glad, above all, for your own sake. She held out her hand to him. He considered it critically. Then he bowed over it. I'll not presume to take it in the hand of a thief and a pirate, said he bitterly. You are no longer that, she said, and strove to smile. Yet I owe no thanks to you that I am not, he answered. I think there's no more to be said, unless it be to add the assurance that Lord Julian Wade has also nothing to apprehend from me. That, no doubt, will be the assurance that your peace of mind requires.